So in this lecture with cell injury and death, um, I want to start off by reintroducing this idea of pathology, where we said it's the study of suffering, where we've got study being the logos side, and we've got uh, or um, and suffering being the pathos side, and it it truly bridges clinical practice and basic science, which is one of the reasons I think it's one of my favorite classes uh, to teach. I mean, I've taught all sorts of different classes in my tenure, and um, this is one of my favorite classes to land on because it's very translational. Um, and I don't mean anything disrespectful about this, but you know, some of my less favorite classes were the early classes that you have to take. You know, like your 181s and 182s, where there's a lot of really fascinating information, but there's a bunch of stuff that you're like, I'm just not gonna go in this direction. So kind of don't care as much about it, right? And but you have to learn some of those processes, um, like in metabolism and glycolysis and aerobic respiration, because we're actually gonna use it here. So this is where I get to reap the benefits of all of the prep work that you guys have done over the years. So you've taken all these classes and now we get to integrate some of this stuff. And that's what I think is so cool. Is there's a lot of light bulb moments in this particular class where you're saying, okay, well now I understand why we had to learn that before. Because I'd have to teach it to you all over again. Now, we'll refresh some of the review stuff so maybe it's a little bit more familiar and you might have to do a little bit of brush up on your own. But the, it's very intentional that there's prerequisites in this class because we are bridging clinical practice and basic science. Um, and another way of saying that is a very translationally relevant class. Pathology investigates um, the causes, what we said etiologies of diseases and those underlying mechanisms with the pathology, or the pathogenesis rather. So let's talk right now. We've had two examples that we've looked at already. One we call barren esophagus in the last lecture, and then the second one we gave an example very similar um, with a duodenal ulcer or a stomach ulcer. And we can now appreciate that, okay, there was something traumatic happening to those cells. They were undergoing trauma, and they were undergoing damage as a result of hydrochloric acid. So, all right, stay away from hydrochloric acid. Got it, Dr. Keller. Won't play with hydrochloric acid, okay? Well, there's a lot of other things that we experience in our environment that cause cellular changes or adaptations. And like what was appropriately mentioned before, this is the body's way of defending itself. It's gonna to respond to the stresses that it's placed under, which we're all happy for. And we do a pretty good job most of the time as a body responding to the stresses that we're placed under. So you've got a normal cell under homeostasis, and you guys remember from your general bio classes, homeostasis doesn't mean static, correct? What does homeostasis mean? Negative. It goes up and down, okay, like that. What else? Balance, okay, that's a good word. Equilibrium. Equilibrium, love that word. What does homeostasis mean to you? Maintaining, I like that. Maintaining a, a, an internal environment that is fluctuating around a control set point while everything else around you is swirling around haphazardly. Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of examples of homeostasis. Temperature, right? pH in our bodies. Oxygenation levels. CO2 levels. Um, protein catabolism, hormonal levels, all of, all of these things fluctuate. Well, under stress, there's an increased demand on the cell and it adapts. Well, if you have an injury and the cell or the cell is unable to adapt, it might lead to an injury, like take Barrett esophagus, where there's stratified squamous epithelium. And if the injury is not a, it, is a result of the adaptation not being able to be happening, then you're gonna get either what we call reversible cell injury. Like I said in Barrett esophagus, it is reversible. So if you treat the GERD, then the epithelium, believe it or not, will go back to stratified squamous. If you have an esophageal adenocarcinoma, it's not gonna completely disappear, but you can have it removed. Okay, you can surgically snip it off or tie it off. 
okay, ligate it, cauterize, and then you remove the GERD while you treat the patient with um, medications to prevent the GERD, and you'll get reversible cell injury. You'll get back to um, stratified squamous. If you've had a duodenal ulcer or a stomach ulcer, it's not permanent. It will heal, okay? So there's reversible cell injury, but there's some point of irreversibility. And that point of irreversibility goes into this pathway of what we call necrosis. And so in this lecture, we're gonna compare and contrast directly necrosis pathways to apoptosis. So if we back up a little bit, apoptosis, what the heck does that mean? Well, apoptosis is a process where the body actually programs the cell for an organized death. It's called cell suicide. It's probably a horrible thing to say this day and age because of our awareness of suicide issues um, within, the, within the country or within the world. But way back when, when it wasn't dangerous to say that, we would, we would actually, textbooks would refer to it as cellular suicide. Program organized cell death. Well, when is that a good thing? Hey, everybody put your hands up. Look between your digits. What do you see? Nothing, right? So at one point in time, there was tissue there in utero as an embryo. And through apoptotic mechanisms, your digits actually divided. And so you were programmed to have five and five and five and five digits through apoptotic signaling. Maybe you know friends where that apoptotic signaling didn't work out completely perfect, okay? And they have like a web digit, right? So that's where apoptosis actually is functional in our bodies. Here's another one that we'll get to when we talk about the immune system. Um, we talked about Peyer's patches and we talked about lymphocytes. Well, lymphocytes are actually manufactured by your body in about 90 to 95% of your lymphocytes are scheduled for programmed cell death. You don't use them. The reason you don't use them is they're self-reactive. You make them, and then they're gonna go attack your own body, and so you say, uh-uh, let's turn them off, schedule them for program death, and let's recycle their parts. So apoptosis over here, when you apoptotically destroy a cell, you actually, or it's an organized move out. You pack everything up nice and neatly, meaning like the cellular organelles, and you'll recycle mitochondria, you'll recycle ribosomes, so that's why you would use apoptosis. Necrosis is disorganized. Necrosis is what happens when tissue becomes infected, when you have a trauma. Okay, if you're gonna go into emergency medicine, you're gonna see, unfortunately, a lot of necrotic tissue. And we'll show you examples of both, okay? But that's the big difference, is necrosis is disorganized, kind of like nasty-looking tissue, foul-smelling, it's rotten. And apoptosis, is winding things down very methodically, okay? So, we'll look at these different things that take place in this lecture. Right now, I wanna talk about these cellular adaptations. We've got a couple to compare and contrast, like physiologic versus pathogenic. So, a physiologic adaptation, a physiologic adaptation is one that's the result of a normal process. So, think about like, embryonic development. There's a lot of things that are changing there. Think about adolescence, puberty. A lot of things that are changing there. Think about the female menstrual cycle. A lot of things that change there, but those are physiologic, those are normal. So three examples of physiologic versus a pathogenic uh, cellular adaptation. This is a result of a disease like Barrett esophagus or premature gastric emptying where you've got stomach acid going into duodenum and you get a duodenal ulcer. That's pathogenic. The cells change, but they're not supposed to, and they're, they're changing because of a disease condition. We've got um, cellular atrophy. Cellular atrophy is where the cell what does what? Shrinks. Shrinks. Cellular hypertrophy? What's that one? What happens to the cell in hypertrophy? It gets, it gets bigger, it enlarges. Hyperplasia, an increase in what? Cellular number, 
not just the size of the cell, that's hypertrophy. Hyperplasia is where you have more cells. Two become four, four become eight, eight become 16. And then metaplasia we've already defined. What is metaplasia? Is it reversible or irreversible? It's reversible, thank you, very good. Reversible cellular change where, what? One cell type is replaced by another cell type. Give me a clinical example where you might see cellular metaplasia. Smoking, okay, you must have looked ahead. I like that. Give me a clinical example that we already talked about. Barrett, thank you. We're gonna talk about smokers one here in a second. Thanks for looking ahead, I appreciate that. A lot of great test questions that could come off of this particular slide. These will be called level one test questions. Right, like, do you know the definition of these terms? Are you with me? Okay, so a lot of this information is all of this is game on testable material. Can I ask the test questions about metaplasia and link it to Barrett? Yeah, absolutely. Would you understand that connection? Would you would you be able to make that connection? I would hope so. And and because I've hinted at it, I really hope you can. Okay. Let's look at. Um, some of these cellular adaptations like one at a time. So here's one that's happening with myocardium. So this is cardiac tissue. This is a um, transection through the ventricle of the heart where you've got the left ventricle here and oh, I, who's doing that? the right ventricle on the other side and Here's a normal myocyte cartoon format. And let's say that there's an increase in load. So the heart sees a load that it has to work against. Let's say blood pressure goes up. The patient's hypertensive, high blood pressure. That means the heart has to work harder because the back pressure it's working against has gone up. That's why high blood pressure is a bad thing. It makes your heart work harder. So if a patient has high blood pressure, then this myocyte is going to adapt and respond to the increase in load. Is that physiologic or pathogenic? Yeah. High blood pressure, is that pathogenic or physiologic? Yeah. What's high blood pressure? Is it a good condition or a bad condition? Yeah. It's a bad condition, right? If you're hypertensive, you have high blood pressure, you want to lower it. So, High blood pressure, this is a pathogenic response, but it increases in response to the load and it gets enlarged, hypertrophy. This is what happens to striated muscle. Skeletal and cardiac muscle are both striated muscle. That's why when you go to the gym and you exercise, like you lift, you, you lift bicep brachii or you do pectoralis major, you know, bench pressing, those cells, those skeletal myocytes actually enlarge. That's exactly what's happening here. Okay. Now, this is what that myocardium is going to look like. So you get a thickened wall, you get an enlarged heart. That's called cardiac myopathy. Now, if we go this direction, we can see there's a cell injury where we might have um, damage to the myocyte. Let's say, for example, we have a blockage in blood flow to the heart. Well, now the myocyte gets starved of oxygen, so it dies, or it's on its way for death. If it goes through cellular death, which would be necrosis, then you're gonna have this area of necrotic tissue, which is like a wedge-shaped necrosis. We're gonna call this coagulative necrosis. We'll characterize that probably next week. But this dead tissue right here is due to the cellular death that took place as a result of a loss of blood flow. So here you've got reversibility. Here you've got reversibility. If you remove the high blood pressure, the heart will actually remodel back to a normal state. So an example of cellular adaptation with respect to hypertrophy and a loss of blood flow leading to what we call a cardiac infarct. We'll come back to this example at the very last lecture of the semester when we look at cardiovascular diseases. So I'm just gonna be forecasting to then but this fits into the category of today's lecture with respect to hypertrophy and the remodeling that takes place. Yes? Can you also do a visual exercise to consider the difference with high blood pressure? Would that be physiologic? 
So in this condition, it would be considered pathogenic because you have high mean arterial pressure, which is dangerous, it's a disease. Um, in the gym, um, typically it's considered physiologic because it's a load, it gives favorable and there's no real side effects. The only caveat to the gymnasium example with skeletal muscle hypertrophy is if you're going through steroidal therapy at the same time, you're gonna actually see these kinds of changes happening with the heart as well, with the steroid use. And um, that's actually considered pathogenic. So as long as the exercise is targeting certain muscle groups, it's considered physiologic. I was gonna say like, from a survival standpoint, like, Would be considered physiologic? Yeah. Chronic high blood pressure is a bad thing. Yeah. So you're right. I, I, I would agree with you. Um, that's a sympathetic nervous system fight or flight response. So, you know, if you're going to be chased by a bear, your blood pressure is going to go up. Um, and so let's say your, you know, your blood pressure normally sits at like 110 over 70, and you're being frightened and you need to escape. Now you're at you know 155 over you know 85 or 90 even, uh, and you run away. Well, five minutes later you're going to be back down to 110 over 70. Where if you can, so that's true. I agree with you there. If you have atherosclerotic disease, and so when you're laying down at night to go to bed and your blood pressure is 180 over 110, that's high blood pressure that's pathological. Thanks for clarifying. Makes a lot more sense. Okay, this is an interesting slide. Um, this is an atrophy example. And we've got two brains here. We've got a young brain on your left, and we have an older brain on your right. And in, in these brains, the, the left hemisphere, okay, the left hemisphere has the meningeal tissues removed, so you can really appreciate the gyri and sulci. And this is a young brain on the left and an old brain on the right. What are some of the differences that you notice? And they're about the same sized individual by mass and height, but just difference in age. Go ahead. There's, a, there's bigger gaps in the older one. Bigger gaps in the older one, I agree. Do you think that there's more or less tissue in the older brain than there is in the young brain? Less, I would agree, less, less mass. And in fact, if you weighed the two, this brain would weigh less, it would have a lower mass. The atrophy that's happening over time in the brain tissue is slow because that terminology of vascular disease, that happens everywhere in the body. And so as vascular disease happens as we age, the ability for the vessels to bring uh, blood flow to different tissues is compromised, slow. Not to the point where it shuts off immediately and the patient has a stroke. This has just been happening slowly over time where the carotid vessels that feed the brain tissue might be reduced by 50%. If you have a 50% occlusion, you may not even get treated, okay? You have plenty of blood flow. It's just over 50, 60 years of that, this tissue is, is compromised of oxygen. And so you have atrophy as a result of chronic, slow reduction in blood flow to the brain. Does that make sense? So I, I want you to be able to understand. So age, this slide does two things for me. One is it reminds me that age is a pathology. The aging process is a disease. And it's hard for you to understand that because you're young. But if you talk to your parents or your grandparents, and you explain things, they'll, they'll agree with you. Yep, absolutely, Dr. Keller is right. Age is a disease, and it's a horrible disease at that. So anytime we're looking at something, or anytime you're looking at something, let's say you're gonna be treating patients, okay? Whether you're a nurse, whether you're doing dental hygiene, whether you're a physician, whether you're a dentist, PT, if you're dealing with a geriatric patient, you're gonna be going through a different protocol than you will with a young patient. You're gonna be more careful and pay a slightly higher attention to detail. So that's one thing this slide tells me is age is a pathology. Number two, what this tells me is you can have issues with tissue 
acutely or slowly over time. So this is over, what, 75 years of a reduction of blood flow, just a little bit less every day. And this is what happens, is you get atrophy of neuronal tissue. Okay, yes? Well, I mean, I mean, we can go on maybe after class or in an office hours about the ideas. But I mean, as an organism, I mean, we're over seventy percent water based. So if you're if you have any amounts of dehydration, your ability to perform physiologic physiologically will be compromised. That, that's absolutely true. And then most of us, you know, we're we're drinking caffeine kind of throughout the day, which is a diuretic, right? Um, and, and that just means it facilitates water loss by urination. Um, so, I mean, there, there's probably some truth to that, but um, why do we age? Nobody knows the answer to that. So, so I'd argue that nobody has answered that question of why we age. Now, we've got some theories, um, and the biggest theories are related to telomeres, and we'll talk about that in our cancer lecture. Uh, when we talk about uh, telomerase and telomere length. Um, but most of the recent data on aging is pointing to telomere and telomere, telomere length. Or I guess with telomere's length does matter, so. Okay, um, hypertrophy. Let's talk about an increase in, in cell um, uh, size. So in hypertrophy, this is uh, uterine tissue. On the left image, you've got a gravid uterus or a pregnant uterus, and then a normal or quote unquote non-pregnant uterus. So you can appreciate the hypertrophic response or capability of a uterus to go through hypertrophy. Physiologic or pathogenic? Physiologic, right? Development, normal development, okay? This tissue here is harder to see. I think this, the side screen showed the histology a little bit better. <clears throat> You've got smooth muscle uterine tissue, hematoxyl and neosin stain, a little bit more vibrant pink here. And hopefully you can appreciate, like right here, there's a purple dot, that's the cellular nuclei. There's a bunch of purple dots down here, those are cellular nuclei. Um, you can see some scattered in here. But for the most part, these cells are smooth muscle cells that look more spindle-like. Smooth muscle cells look kind of like a spindle, meaning that are kind of more fat in the middle, and then they narrow on the side, sort of like this. Okay. So normal, um, non-pregnant uterine smooth muscle and then gravid uterus or uterine muscle. So here what I want you to be able to see and appreciate is, can you see that they're not spindle-like with maybe a nucleus in the middle? They're actually kind of rounded up and then the nucleus is like this. Can you kind of make that out from these, from these histology slides? So I'll point one out. Um, so this one might be the best one or the best example. There's the nuclei right there where my trying to keep it still. And then you can kind of appreciate that this is the cell that's more rounded up, whereas these guys are kind of long and narrow. Okay? Hypertrophy. Okay? Physiologic hypertrophy. All right, hyperplasia, also physiologic with the menstrual cycle or with pregnancy. So this is a gravid uterus. Obviously, post-mortem uh, just means after the patient has expired. And the darker pigmented tissue that you're seeing in this picture, the darker pigmented tissue right in the center, uh, the higher, the, the, or the darker the color, the greater the cell number. And then as you move more towards the periphery, like here and over here, you can see the tissue lightens in color because there's fewer cells. And so that's how you know that it's higher cell counts in kind of the middle of that uterus tissue. Okay, so your colleague mentioned smoking and metaplasia, and this is the slide that uh, presumably he was forecasting that we would talk about. And in this particular slide, what I want to be able to show you is metaplasia is reversible, and this is another example of a metaplastic change because of an irritant. Here the irritant is not hyper hypochloric acid. Here the irritant is cigarette smoke, and smoker, just like we talked about. Uh, we don't know yet 
it maybe does this, okay? But in the respiratory section, we're gonna talk about vaping. We're gonna talk about e-cigarettes and vaping and what we do know about it today. And um, between now and then, we might have more information. But last semester, there was like a plethora of new information that came out on vaping. So it was kind of like a field day for me updating slides, which was kind of fun, okay? Um, but right now, what we do know about tobacco smoke or cigarettes, traditional cigarettes, is we've got this change that takes place where we've got normal ciliated columnar epithelium in the trachea. Now we're in the other two, not the esophagus, we're in the, the windpipe or the trachea. We have these little cilia and they actually help encourage, right, the mucus escalator where you, <clears throat> you cough up, right, stuff that gets trapped in your trachea. You guys with me? It's exaggerated when we have a chest cold, right? And you have a productive cough that just means you're coughing up loonies all the time. Okay, and you're like, look, oh, look, it's green, right? And so that, that's actually getting it out of your lungs. And that's the normal function of the ciliated columnar epithelium. This is all redo. Now, what ends up happening, so this is the corresponding histology, again, pink and purple. So you can see the pink, like the, the pink is exaggerated toward the bottom here. And then the nuclei are far more pronounced. All the purple large spheres are the nuclei. And right here is this transition, and here's where that transition is on the corresponding um, cartoon drawing, where we actually move away from ciliated columnar epithelium to a stratified squamous epithelium. Like, wait, we're in the trachea. What abrasive substances would we be breathing in on a normal basis? Nothing, right? We are not designed to have stratified squamous in our trachea or in our primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, or in any of our respiratory tree. But what is happening here? You guys tell me, what do you think is happening right here? Why is that switching? Yeah, so this example is not e-cigarettes. This one's just regular cigarettes. Okay, but did you guys hear all that? That's exactly right. He says, maybe, he said maybe, I think there was a smirk, maybe there's something toxic in cigarette smoke that we shouldn't be inhaling. Maybe. How many of you think that's a maybe? Well, seriously? Like two? Two of you think it's a maybe? Well, there's documented evidence that, that cigarette smoke is pretty harmful uh, to our lungs. So let's dive in a little deeper. Um, so more pathology. So you can see on this species on the left, species human, the organ is lung, the diagnosis is emphysema. We'll talk about emphysema, that will be one of the diseases that we go through. Um, and we're gonna dive in to this slide and zoom in in higher magnification until we get here. And so what I want you to be able to appreciate with this slide um, is exactly the type of uh, analysis we did with Barrett's So we've got our columnar epithelium, again, mostly pink background, that's the ESM, and then purple nuclei that you're able to see. This is actually a very high magnification view, so hopefully this will be helpful where you can actually appreciate, oh, there's the purple nuclei that he keeps talking about, but we're at 40x magnification, so when we zoom out, those dots get smaller, okay? And here in the red, this is this transition zone. So this is an actual patient sample. This came out of the University of Iowa. Uh, this is stratified squamous epithelium that is transitioning just microns away from the normal tissue because of the irritation in the pollutants that are found in tobacco smoke. So it's not just cigarette smoke, it's actually all tobacco smoke. So these are, these, this epithelium, just like with Barrett, has a progenitor cell that actually turns over and replenishes that cellular population. And so that progenitor cell is mutated, going through another metaplasia. Questions? Okay, so let me ask you again. How many of you think that this contents of tobacco smoke probably shouldn't be going into our lungs? So now, now I'm confident you guys are paying a little more attention. I want to talk a little bit in the remaining moments. We just have a minute or two. I'm only going to set this up, and then we're going to hit the pause button. Because what I don't want to do, and this is my promise to you, is 
I don't want it to feel like at the very end, like, I got like 10 more slides in three minutes. So it's like, right? We're not going to do that. We'll just pick it up comfortably the next time. But I want to set the stage. We've looked at HCL causing cellular damage, right? Retrograde and forward grade or proximally and distally. Now we've looked at harmful agents in tobacco smoke. Well, all of these things can cause cellular injury. And we could have another three or four slides of, of brainstorming ideas of things that can cause cellular injury. But these are pretty large categories that cause the most number of issues. So we've got hypoxia. What's hypoxia? Suffocating. Suffocating. Yeah, yeah, that would lead to hypoxia, right? Hypoxia is a lack of oxygen. Suffocation would cause hypoxia. Very good. Okay. So too much, too little oxygenation. Hyperoxia, what's the opposite of that? Too much. Too much can be bad. And we'll talk about hyperoxia situations, or what we call reactive oxidative species, or what we call ROSs. These are free radicals. So many of you that are diet junkies, you're really into your diet, and you're trying to find foods that are free radical scavengers or antioxidants, you are trying to battle the second bullet point with the blueberries that you keep eating. Uh, chemicals like HCL, okay, there are others. Infectious agents, immunological reactions, genetic defects, nutritional imbalances, okay? You can have an iron deficiency or a zinc deficiency and that can lead to cellular damage. Um, physical agents like trauma, and then of course I mentioned today already aging. So we're gonna unpack a lot of these different things this semester um, that cause cellular injury. Now, what I want you to do pause, is I want to make sure that by the end of the week, you guys take your pre-quiz on cell injury. We haven't finished the lecture, so it would be wise for you to look at the rest of the lecture, read the chapter, okay? Here's a hint. I don't take down my lectures from last year. They're still there. They're labeled S, I'm sorry, F19 for fall of 19, and the only one that's there is the first one that says S to zero, and so the second half of this lecture from last semester, where I was younger and smarter and better looking, is there. So if you really want to nail the pre-quiz, you can watch the lecture before we even have it next week. Okay, but the lecture quiz, or the pre-quiz is due Monday, and I want to make sure you guys take it. The next thing is, Richard's got a quick announcement for you, so if you guys can pay close attention to this for me. Hi guys, uh, first tentative SI session for the uh, semester is going to be Friday at 2 o'clock over in Bury 109. Does everyone know where Bury is at? Is it across the way? Yeah, we're down in the dungeon. That's a joke, you can laugh. Bury 109 on Friday at 2. 2. So if you want to digest some of this information, if you have questions, if you haven't taken your pre-quiz yet, Come on by, let's talk about it. Also, I've been through the rest of this lecture. I might be able to help you out with some of that if you don't go look at last semester's lecture. Any questions? Okay, guys have a great week. Again, no class on Monday. I'll see you a week from today.